All right. Well, I'm just going to start and talk, and eventually people will come, <laughs> come on in. Uh, I'm Maureen Conway. I am a vice president here at the Aspen Institute and executive director of the Economic Opportunities Program. And as I said, it is my delight to welcome you to day two of the Employee Ownership Ideas Forum, a wonderful place to meet other people and chat, as we're already seeing <laughs> this morning, and share common interests. Um, uh, it's also uh, my pleasure to, to thank my colleagues at the Rutgers Institute for the Study of Employee Ownership and Profit Sharing for their partnership on this event. Um, and, and I do, uh, I, I want to take a moment before I, I sort of launch in to also uh, thank my team who has been, um, you know, it, it's so helpful in pulling this all together. We wouldn't have an event without them. So I really want to thank Matt Helmer, Sinin Young, Joy Moore, Tony Mastria, Francis Almodovar, Fr Maxwell Johnson, Amanda Finns, Merritt Steuben, Bryn Morgan, Maya Smith, Nora Heffernan, Joyce Klein, and Lauren Starks for their help in putting this event on. It takes a lot of folks, so um, so really just want to give them a round of applause. So um, thanks to them. Um, so I hope that you, uh, for those of you who are able to be with us in person or, or virtually, I hope you enjoyed yesterday's conversation and I hope you enjoy today's as well. Um, I also want to thank um, our supporters for this event, the Beister Foundation for Enterprise Development, the J. Robert Beister Endowment at Rutgers School of Management and Labor Relations, Prudential Financial, and J.P. Morgan Chase & Company. We have an amazing day in front of us. We're going to start this morning with uh, two panels, one that's going to really uh, look at sort of the potential for employee ownership to strengthen the middle class, and then we'll follow that with one looking at uh, race and gender equity. Um, for those of you who are here today, we're then going to have some private breakout conversations because we really do want to engage you all in this conversation. Um, and so we're going to, you have a handout. Um, so, but I'd like you to be thinking about some of these questions this morning as we go through, so you can be thinking about what you want to bring to those conversations uh, when we get there. Um, uh, so we're going to be talking about what is missing from the discourse and narrative on employee ownership, what additional information, research, topics, issues, or public conversations such as the one today would be helpful, what new audiences and stakeholders we should be engaging, and the role you see them playing and, and, and ideas maybe for reaching them. Um, for those of you joining us virtually, we'd love your thoughts on this on these questions as well and I think we've dropped the handout in the chat so you can see these questions and uh, there's many ways you can get in touch with us to share your thoughts um, including just putting your thoughts in the chat um, after lunch, we're going to wrap up with uh, two more panels of exceptional leaders and speakers. We'll discuss innovations in employee ownership um, early this afternoon and then close out the day with a conversation on employee ownership and how it aligns with our American spirit and values and how it can be a stronger force um, for really driving our economic competitiveness and innovation, but also for really helping us um, uh, you know, kind of live with the values we sort of aspire to as, as a nation. Um, uh, so that's kind of how we'll, we'll close. And then we'll celebrate. Uh, so then we get through it all and we celebrate with a reception on the seventh floor. So I hope everybody uh, uh, stays through for that to, to celebrate with a, a, a glass of wine and, a, and a, um, some more time to, to chat informally at the end of the day. Um, our panels today have a little different feel to them. We're fortunate to have a number of uh, research fellows from Rutgers Institute for the Study of Employee Ownership and Profit Sharing joining us. So we're going to have a couple of them open with their perspectives on their research uh, um, before each of the panel discussions. Um, uh, again, we'll try to include some Q&A in the panel discussions because we really do want to include everybody in the conversation. Um, OK, last thing before I hand it over to Joseph, um, I need to go through a few logistical uh, items for our, our, our virtual audience. Um, so everyone in the virtual audience is muted, but you can use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to submit and upvote questions. Um, we'd love to hear from you. We also encourage you to share your views in the chat. Um, if you have ideas, examples of re work that you're doing related to today's discussion, please uh, introduce yourself and share them. Uh, we encourage everybody in the room on 
online to tweet about the event. Our hashtag is Talk Ownership. If you have technical issues during the webinar, you can message in the chat or email us at eop.program at aspeninstitute.org. The event is being recorded and will be shared via email and posted on our website. And closed captions are available. Please click the CC button at the bottom of your screen if you would like to use them. And that is my opening announcement. So Joseph, now I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Maureen. And again, I'd like to express uh, my appreciation to uh, to Aspen. Aspen has been a fantastic uh, uh, collaborator. Uh, and to uh, uh, the Beister family uh, and Prudential and J.P. Morgan Chase for your support. I'd also like to specifically thank the members of the Rutgen, Rutgers team. We've had a team of 10 made up of uh, Rutgers and Aspen uh, workers uh, working on this for four, uh, four months. Uh, Jack Moriarty, Bethany Dennis, Chris Michael, Adria Scharf and Douglas Cruz, who worked on the research, research brief. Um, so we're kind of featuring uh, the uh, research fellows from the Institute's fellowship program. Over the last 15 years, uh, Rutgers has appointed 15 to 30 research fellows every year to try to develop this, this field. And you'll get to meet a lot of them during the day. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Abba Bhattarai from the uh, Washington Post. Uh, she's an economics correspondent at the Washington Post. I have read many of her fantastic pieces. And she will lead the panel today, which we made up of uh, Richard Freeman from Harvard, uh, Fidan Kertulis from the University of Massachusetts, uh, Tomas uh, Duran uh, from Concern Capital. Tomas, would you please come up? Uh, uh, Stephen Smith from Amstead Industries. Stephen, would you please join us? And Steve Storkin from the Employee Ownership Expansion Network. Uh, our colleague Doug Cruz is running a little late, and he will just join the panel when he arrives. Abba, I'm turning it over to you, your capable hands. Thank you very much. So Richard, if you want to come up here and, and kick us off, that'd be great. <clears throat> OK, hi, everybody. I had prepared an extraordinary PowerPoint about employee ownership. Just wait till you hear the rest. In Kalabi Yao space, which is part of the multiverse of physics. And unfortunately, people said, no, that would not do <laughs> for this group. Um, so I'll have, give a little a, a different t talk. Um, first, I, I think it was a great idea of having yesterday's session before the research session. Because seeing practitioners learning the problems they're having in the field, learning what goals they have, really is something that every research person should, should respond to. We should be doing things. Um, originally, Joseph had said to me, oh, talk about all the good that we find in the research. There's no point to my saying that. You heard that from every single uh, person. The interesting part, of the, I think, is the mixture between the statistical data that allows one to generalize and the individual uh, qualitative uh, things about this company did this, that company did that. And that is a tough business in research to combine those two together. And this is one of the places I think that's being done best. Um, Joseph also made another comment last uh, yesterday. He said, gee, every five years, people want us to reproduce the same results. And uh, I think, actually, th th there's great virtue to that. It, the social world is not like the physics world. Um, the electrons are always electrons. They've been electrons forever. Um, we are people. Things can work in a society with one technology. They can work in one society and not in another society. Um, and, and so it is, it is actually important to continually be reassessing with new data uh, 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 things that uh, stand up.
the, in this field, it is, Joseph was absolutely right, the, the results are they're, they're stronger, there's more statistics, there's more this and that, but they stick, they, they, they've lasted. The other comment I want to make about uh, the, the research activities is that we always are talking about averages. So it's a 2% productivity uh, increase that we see in, in some of the data. There's always a dispersion. There's always around that number. The really positive part of the research that's been done in employee ownership is that in that dispersion, it turns out to be reasonably balanced in the following sense. In some research areas, people are incredibly want to, and we do want to see good results. But that often means that you can't publish bad results. Uh, referees will go over your, there's got to be something wrong if, you've, if you did not find a positive uh, uh, outcome. And so what they normally ask for in the research is that it be a reasonably normal distribution. There's the mean, the average, and there should be some negatives, and there should be some positives. If all there are are positives, you can be a bit suspicious that there's been some sort of selectivity of which research appears. Here, there's been none of that. The, 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 you see, you can go look at the, here's the average effects, here's the, the, the range of effects. So it's a very, in that sense, very trustworthy uh, 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 set, set, set of results. Make another comment. It comes from the, yesterday. The notion that, uh, gee, what does it mean that this employee ownership has been raised basically 10 percent of private sector workers ad finitum? And here's an area I don't think we've done enough research on, uh, because the, uh, the 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 person from the banking in the last sector, she said, well. Um, We've been, we've been succeeding in getting things going in. And so we've got to put into the equations of the analysis who's going out. And it's got to be done in a more of a, I would say, demographic way. So we study inflows, outflows, and growth of people in the who, who remain. And we really haven't done that. So I took that as a, uh, a very useful uh, uh, guide that we should do a, 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 a study that, 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 that does that. Um, OK. Um, now the, I want to make a comment about what we might begin to expect as we analyze this, the new law that we think, well, it isn't the new law yet, but the prospective new law. And if you think about who should get employee ownership, and there's a divergence, some companies will, will benefit a lot, some will benefit not so much. But you'd think the people who have it now are, good, are the best beneficiaries. If we're trying to extend the margin, it's likely to be people of lower uh, benefits. If, if, if there was a 10 percent productivity gain, we'd see two-thirds of the companies would jump over, and it would be like this Italy uh, example that was, that was, was, was mentioned just yesterday. Um, right now, I'd say we have no evidence that the marginal people who are coming in are worse. It's a theoretical expectation. If the, if the people who benefit the most come in first, as you begin extending the number of people, you'd see a decline. But we have no evidence of that. And that's an interesting, testable kind of thing that researchers can, um, uh, you know, can, 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 can look at. The, before, actually, before I, 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 I uh, came here, I have a neighbor who's a management consultant of sorts. And I, and I said, oh, I'm going to this conference, dot, 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 employee ownership, ESOP. And he says, well, they better not own their own company, because that's too risky. <laughs> Everybody has heard this. And that's one of the places where the research has been incredibly powerful to say, no, they're more likely to have 401k plans, and the, and the people leave with the, uh, with the, with the assets. So that's a case, it's a reasonable expectation that it's going to be more risky. And many um, economists and, and business consultants, my neighbor, are very 
they are sure that that's going to be the, the situation, and it's not. So that the research can, 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 in this case, it came up with positive results for the employee ownership, but it could have come up with, with ne 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 negative. I have two more comments, and then I'll sit down. Um, the one thing that we as researchers lack in this area is a very clear optimizing model for how employee ownership operates. The, the max demand for a typical firm that we can live with, that all economists live with, is it's maximizing profits. And if it doesn't meet the profit goal, it dies eventually. That's, that's the essential uh, model. For employee ownership, well, this came up yesterday in many different ways. You're obviously maximizing something that has not only the profits in it, but the well-being of workers in it. And then the condition of, 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 of should it survive? Well, imagine a firm that's employee-owned, the workers are better off, and the uh, so there are social benefits that, that, that flow as well from the way the firm is operating, some externalities, positive externalities. Well, it shouldn't be that that firm is operating, uh, you know, the, the profit maximizing. We're not quite sure how to, to, to sort of represent in a very simple way. Okay, that's fine. Um, my last comment. <laughs> um, uh, thinking about how one's going to look at this law as it proceeds, uh, or assuming it's passed, uh, I, I'm very, I was deeply concerned about what happens if it adds very few workers. What should we be looking at as a goal to go back to the Congress or the, or, or the people and say, this succeeded? And it'd be, I think it would be very nice to have a research program which where we can actually set down a bunch of analyses that says, this is what we expect. And I'll tell you my expectation. First, I talked to Dick May, who's sitting here someplace. Uh, and I said, what do you expect? Because you're very important in this process and thinking about things. And he said, well, first thing you better think remember is if we have 13 million people today in ESOPs, only 3 million are in the non-public, uh, publicly owned. They're in the, the private ownership things. That's where this is targeted at, largely. So we should not be thinking about, will the 13 million grow to 15 million or 14 million in a period of time and say, oh, that's not very much. In fact, we should be thinking of, we're targeting small firms and then the, 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 the growth of those firms, which will not be adding as many employees as if one large firm shifts. And he's going to run me out of here by one, more, one last <laughs> sentence. Um, because I thought Jim Bonham's discussion of the, the five things was ex really very good yesterday. I, and I told him this. I said, this is really laid out a, part, a research agenda for looking at things. And I'll do one more one. He's not, he's not raising it. Uh, if you had a hook, you see, that's what you should. You, the, uh, my expectation would be there will be a bigger increase in the number of employee-owned enterprises than there will be of workers. And that reflects the being small, et cetera. And now I am done. Okay, so uh, I, I've been told that I'm introducing the, the first few fellows, uh, and then Abba will take control of the uh, panel. Uh, I'd like to introduce my colleague, uh, uh, Douglas Cruz, who is a uh, distinguished professor at Rutgers and associate director of the Institute for the Study of Employee Ownership and Profit Sharing. Doug. Very glad to be here. I, uh, Joseph told me I had five minutes. And I, I timed myself out at four minutes, 30 seconds. So I think I'm OK, although I just spent 10 seconds telling you all that. <laughs> um, I, I've been studying employee ownership for uh, several decades now. Uh, when I started, my hair was brown, and now my hair is gray. So the only logical conclusion is that studying employee ownership turns your hair gray. I think that's obvious. Um, I did a, uh, I updated a, uh, 
summary, a policy brief for IZA on what we know about employee ownership. Well, what does all the research evidence tell us? It's just an eight-page, pretty reader-friendly uh, uh, thing that anyone is welcome to look at. It, uh, um, it has an honest-to-God elevator pitch. They told me, put an elevator pitch up front, labeled elevator pitch. So it's, I think, a pretty uh, reader-friendly thing. Um, just briefly here, we're, I, I outlined four categories of reasons that we're interested in employee ownership. One is uh, the effects on firms and firm performance. Uh, Rich, Richard referred to that. Actually, he, he did note that uh, we would expect Theoretically, we'd expect early adopters to be the ones who would benefit most, and later adopters not to benefit as much. The, a meta-analysis of over 102 studies found that, over the past several decades, found that if anything, the effects are growing more positive over time, um, which is really interesting that we don't see this, uh, uh, the, this tail off. Um, the second category is worker outcomes, pay, quality of work life, and so forth. Third category of reasons we're interested in employee ownership is uh, for the overall economy, economic stability, uh, and layoffs. Uh, Fadon and I have done uh, done some work on this, and that's really interesting because there may be some, as Alex Brill was saying yesterday, positive externalities in economist language to uh, greater greater employment stability, uh, positive benefits for the entire economy, and finally societal outcomes, in particular, income and wealth distribution and uh, rebuilding the middle class. That's what we're talking about this morning. Um, I want to uh, just kick off the session on rebuilding the middle class with uh, three quick facts, one informed prediction, and one logical conclusion. The fact number one is that inequality has been going up. That's not controversial. I think we all know that from a variety of, it's been going up in a variety of ways. Fact number two, there's been a shift from labor to capital income. The, uh, the, there's a greater share of national income now going to owners of capital than there was several decades ago. Um, we, we, Joseph and I found the capital income for the middle quintile of households, the people in the middle, dropped over the past three decades. Fact number three, capital income is distributed more unequally than labor income. The top 20% receives 90% of all, all capital income. So those are pretty, I think, uncontroversial facts. The informed prediction is that the shift to capital income is likely to continue. That's what Thomas Piketty tells us. Um, technology is becoming increasingly productive and important in our lives. I think we all recognize how much technology dominates our lives and how uh, anguished we are when our computer's not working. Well, sometimes relieved. It's like, oh, don't have to respond to those emails now. Um, Okay, so that's the inf three facts in informed prediction. The logical conclusion from all that, I think, is to increase the economic well-being of the middle and lower classes. Workers need increased access to capital income uh, through employee ownership, profit sharing, other sharing arrangements. And that was a key motivation for Senator Russell Long, who put ESOPs into the 1940 notes here. Um, and, and Richards made a nice argument that uh, he, who owns the robots rules the world. We, he, by robots, he's referring to technology in general. Workers need to own the robots that, that may be taking their jobs in order to keep economic progress broadly shared and avoid a two-tiered society. Um, employee ownership is not going to help economic well-being if it just substitutes for other pay and wealth. But evidence from a variety of sources points toward employee ownership generally coming on top of other pay and wealth, functioning like an efficiency wage. We, we, we did a study with a survey of consumer finances by the Federal Reserve and found that uh, it certainly seems to come on top of other pay and wealth. Um, among the 10.1 million active ESOP participants, average ESOP assets are $180,000. Employees have been with their employer 10 years or longer, have an average of over 300,000 in ESOP wealth. And those large average stakes exist both in publicly traded firms, where, t where workers, ESOPs, typically own only 1% to 3% of the shares outstanding, but also in uh, the, major the uh, closely held companies, majority or 100% ESOP owned. Um, 
if we do see an expansion of employership, does that, that mean more financial risk for workers? Uh, Richard is talking about this. Not necessarily. In fact, risk might even be reduced. And I'm a very risk-averse person myself, so I'm very concerned about this. Excessive financial risk is a danger, but we found even among the most risk-averse of 40,000 employees that we surveyed, two-thirds of them want at least some ownership, profit-sharing, or stock options in their pay package. These plans generally come on top of market-level pay and benefits, as we said, so that greatly, uh, greatly reduces the risk. Also, the biggest financial risk faced by most workers is job loss. Um, and as Fadon and I and others have found that there seems to be greater, uh, greater economic stability. Finally, Harry Markowitz, the, the Nobel Prize winner for portfolio theory, uh, worked with us a bit on this. He explicitly rejects the idea the risk aversion condemns employee ownership. Uh, his theory concludes workers can prudently have 10 to 15 percent of their of their assets, their, their own household assets in employee ownership if the rest of their household wealth portfolio is, uh, is well diversified. Just some quick thoughts. Um, I think employee ownership can play an important role in rebuilding the middle class and look forward to hearing what others have to say about this. Okay, so I'm going to invite uh, Richard and Doug to return back to the audience as we prepare for the panel. And Fidan Kurtulis from the University of Massachusetts at Amherst will give our third and last research presentation. Thank you, Fidan. And then Abba will take control of the panel. <laughs> uh, it's supposed to be a Professor Axe confused, so I'm sticking with the uh, image. Fidan. Good morning, everybody. It's so nice to be here today on this beautiful, sunny Washington, D.C. day. My name is Fidan Kurtulis. I'm a professor of economics at University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm also the co-director of the UMass Center for Employment Equity. Um, I've been part of this employee ownership scholars group um, for about a decade now. and. Um, uh, it's been a, a real honor to be a part of it, and I learn new things every time I meet with these um, with these wonderful uh, group of scholars. Um, so, one thing that uh, so before I uh, start my comments, I wanted to mention that yesterday's uh, day one meetings. Um, at the U.S. Senate were very important. Uh, it was a very important interface between scholars, practitioners, and government policymakers. And I was uh, very delighted to hear about the uh, Employee Ownership Investment Act that is being put forward uh, in Congress. Um, I was also very delighted to see representatives from various government agencies, including the Department of Labor, um, the uh, uh, some of the leadership from the Department of Labor uh, was there, and um, I got to pick their brain about um, what data um, they are thinking of collecting beyond the uh, Form 5500 employee ownership uh, in pension plans that pretty much you know, all uh, academic researchers in this area have been using now for decades. We need more uh, employee ownership, nationally representative employee ownership data. And he was very interested in this. And so um, that was also a very nice outcome of the meetings yesterday uh, in Congress. So I wanted to make a couple of comments about um, uh, what research has to say about uh, employee ownership and wealth inequality, income inequality. That was what I was asked to talk about uh, today. Uh, and um, based on some of my own research with um, other uh, co-authors, um, so an important channel through which employee ownership can strengthen the middle class is by strengthening workers' employment stability during economic downturns. Um, so in uh, some of my work with um, Doug, um, we examined uh, employment preservation at employee ownership firms versus firms without employee ownership using the uh, famous Department of Labor Form 5500 data. And uh, we asked whether firms with employee ownership programs exhibit greater employment stability 
in the face of economic downturns and recessions. Um, and we specifically looked at the Great Recession. Uh, and we found that employee ownership firms provided uh, greater employment stability and job preservation um, to their workers. Uh, in particular, uh, when the unemployment rate uh, in the overall economy went up by 1%, firms without employee ownership reduced their employment by 3% as opposed to firms with ESOPs that reduced their employment by only 1.7%. So that's a big difference. Uh, we also found that firms were more likely to survive through economic downturns. And these uh, results are uh, important. Um, uh, for uh, a variety of reasons um, uh, and sort of highlight the strong positive externalities um, that employee ownership can have on the overall economy, including, it, from a broad perspective, reducing unemployment um, and thereby reducing um, the harmful effects on communities, um, reducing crime, um, uh, reduce, uh, increasing uh, family stability, um, the sort of improving the tax base. When people get to keep their jobs, all of these positive externalities happen. Um, also boosting consumer purchasing power. Uh, so there's a clear justification uh, for widespread government support uh, to broaden the prevalence of employee ownership in our society, which is why I was very delighted to hear about the new Employee Ownership Investment Act that um, is um, uh, going through Congress at the moment. Um, so I wanted to close my remarks with um, just some good news about uh, uh, new research that uh, we are doing using uh, US Census data. We're going to be in uh, working on this uh, for probably the next several years, basically using census data on all firms, all workers, and linking it to various um, uh, data sets on employee ownership so that we can actually look at longitudinal relationships over time between employee ownership and things like income and wealth inequality, things like um, uh, whether the benefits of employee ownership are growing over time, which is something that Doug mentioned. Uh, so I wanted to uh, close out on that um, optimistic and positive uh, research note. Thank you very much. All right, so uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to call uh, Veronica Ortiz to the panel and again introduce uh, Appa Bhattarai from the Washington Post. And uh, Appa will now take control of the panel and banish me forever. Okay, thank you, Appa. Really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. All right, good morning, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us. You know, the pandemic really forced a reckoning um, among both workers and employers. And since then, we've heard a lot about the, the continued erosion of the middle class and also about the importance of sort of rethinking the future of work. And I'm really excited to discuss ways in these two challenge and ways that we can bring tackle these two challenges together. And with that, I'd like to start this morning's conversation. Um, as we get started, I'd like to ask each panelist to introduce themselves and maybe comment on their opening remarks, and we'll go from there. Uh, Veronica, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience at Web, Web Industries, which is a 100% employee-owned company in Massachusetts. Um, and for those of us who have never been a part of an employee-owned company, tell us what that's like. Good morning, everyone. First, let me say I'm really honored to be among you all and have learned a lot these past uh, day plus. So thanks for having me. Again, my name is Veronica Ortiz. I'm with Web Industries, um, headquartered in Marlboro, Massachusetts. There, I actually work in IT as the business systems analyst manager. And our team basically helps design, test, train, implement software systems, and support the onboarding of new business. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's hard work, a lot of fun. Again, uh, the Web Industries is a, a precision contractor and, um, sorry, precision converting and contract manufacturing company. 
Uh, we actually started or were founded in 1969 in a small uh, East Boston warehouse and have grown now to nine sites in three countries. And uh, I'm really proud to be part of Web. Uh, and we'll talk more as the day goes. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, Steve Smith, I'd like to turn to you. We have two Steves on this panel. So uh, <laughs> Steve is president and CEO of Amstead Industries Incorporated, which is also 100% employee owned. Uh, can you tell us a bit about yourself and the company? And we'll go from there. Uh, well, and thank you first to the Aspen Institute and to Rutgers and Joseph Blasey for the opportunity to be here and talk about one of my favorite subjects, how employee ownership can work in a rather large corporation over, over 35 years now. So Amstead Industries has been around since 1902. One of our businesses dates back to the 1870s, actually. Um, we're in four businesses. Um, we're in the supply of rail parts, and then the supply of truck parts, and the supply of automobile parts, and then also cooling systems as well. Uh, we're four and a half billion of revenues now, 65 plants around the world, headquartered in Chicago. Um, we, I am proud to say, uh, since we became an ESOP, we became an ESOP in 1985, went 100% in 1998, so this is a 38-year test run here, which seems to be working out pretty well. I'm proud to say we've created over 2,500 millionaires during that time, uh, many people working on the floor. If someone starts at uh, a very modest level of $50,000 uh, a year annual income, by the time they stick around for 27, 28 years, uh, they will be a millionaire. Uh, if they start at 100000 they could be several times over a millionaire. I used to be embarrassed to say that, but with life expectancies what they are and people retiring at 60 or 65, many will live into their 90s, right? Uh, that's sort of the sum you need to have a comfortable retirement, and studies have shown, in fact, that 90% of ESOP participants feel secure about their retirements, and, and that's the reason why. Uh, one of my favorite stories I'll, I have to let in is uh, at our Baltimore air coil business, one day we had just announced our quarterly stock price, as we always do, and uh, one of the workers, his supervisor came up, and the worker on the assembly line was just beaming. He was happy as could be, and, and he says to his supervisor, Joe, I'm really happy today, and, and the supervisor <laughs> says, I, I can see that, but, you know, <laughs> Uh, why? And he says, today I'm a millionaire. And it's stories like that that absolutely keep you going and make it work. People talked about the, you know, it's a competitive advantage. People talked about the great resignation. We had 50 people who started in a cohort of our up-and-coming leaders around the world that we brought together at University of Chicago Business School for three years of training during COVID. They came in quarterly. So these are obviously key people that are building our future. We didn't lose any of those people during the supposed great resignation because they are engaged. It's a competitive advantage that our employees are engaged because they own the company. It makes a difference. But it also affects how management uh, behaves as well, too, because ESAPs are, trusted, are, are structured as a trust from a legal standpoint, but it's more than just a legal relationship. It is a relationship with your employees, and it affects how management views risk. And you don't do things for your ego. You do them for your family that's scattered around you. So it's a powerful structure, and uh, I, I'm proud and always glad to talk about it. So thank you. Tomas Duran is president of Concerned Capital. Tomas, tell us a bit more about yourself, about Concerned Capital, and how it fits into the larger picture here. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me. Maureen, it's great to see you. Um, and uh, I'm real excited to share our story and our approach. Um, it's kind of hard to follow Stephen. I mean, from, from the heights of creating millionaires to where we operate is really <laughs> in the grassroots. We use employee ownership to fight gentrification. We use employee ownership to create the shortest path to the middle class. In, uh, in the Southern California area. I'm an urban planner by training. And what I have do is look at systems and how they interact with each other and found that we have this enormous concentration of manufacturing in Southern California. But it's job shops. There's 8,500 job shops in the supply chain in Southern California. Almost 90% of them are owned by people who are past retirement. But more importantly, they're people who are re relying on the sale of that business to fund their retirement. And they've been through three major economic uh, 
events that have impacted how they look at the world. And so when we come into this space and we talk with the workers and we talk with the people about employee ownership and that path forward or that exit for the owner, it's a real complicated space, but it ends up being something that's a viable option for those retiring owners, but moreover, it puts those um, employees in the driver's seat and it energizes those companies in a way that uh, it's really hard to do beyond that. And the last thing I'll mention is that we love employee ownership because it's the fastest way to sidestep the institutional racism and barriers that keep entrepreneurs of color from starting their own businesses. If the path to wealth in this country is business ownership and home ownership, but it's continually blocked by, th by things that have been institutionalized, whether on purpose or not, it's a real nice way to sidestep that. When you go into a bank and you're the owner of the company and you're trading on that company's track record, you are asking for debt based on how that company's performing, not necessarily who you are as a person. And that's been a really good way for us to sidestep a lot of those things and shortcut um, um, that process. And Steve Storkin, you are executive director of the Employee Ownership Expansion Network and have been involved with ESOPs for more than 25 years. Tell us a bit about yourself and uh, what, what ESOPs can do to strengthen the middle class and forge these connections. Well, thank you very much. Um, hard to follow these three with getting you know, applause and all the great things, but I'll do my best. Um, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the Aspen Institute, uh, Rutgers, and everybody involved. Uh, I thought yesterday was a great day. Um, for those of you that were uh, not there yesterday, um, one of the speakers that resonated with me the most was David Hincapie, who runs the Small Business Administration District Office here. And he stopped and he said to us, Imagine something. Imagine if two-thirds of your city or two-thirds of your state or your county, think of your region, if two-thirds of that place had workers, worker owners, what would that community look like? What would our society feel like? What would change? Well, that's why I get up every day. That's why the people that work with me get up every day. EOX is a national nonprofit that creates, sustains, and helps a network of state centers for employee ownership. We are the boots in the ground on a, in a state that tell everybody about employee ownership. I say whether we can get an audience of five or 5,000, whoever has an audience, we will go and we will speak. Um, we're going to talk more about how that works and how we do that in a little bit. But uh, this was started uh, inside of the National Center for Employee Ownership uh, in around 2014 or 15. We became an official uh, nonprofit organization in 2019. At that time, there were eight state centers for employee ownership. There are now 21 state centers for employee ownership. Uh, and the staff of those, like I said, are the boots in the ground, helping business owners, their advisors, community leaders, again, anybody and everybody that we can to tell them, to help them imagine what it would look like. Because we also heard yesterday, Jim Bonham and others had all of these, you know, the five things that are barriers to entry. And we talked a lot about all of them except for one that kept coming up, which was awareness and knowledge and education. And that's what I'm passionate about. So I'm glad, happy to be here and, and happy to share some more. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Smith, um, often in these conversations about employee ownership, we tend to think about the outcomes for businesses as separate from the outcomes for workers. But obviously, those things are very connected. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how those two pieces come together at Amstead in terms of worker success, business success, and also overall culture. Well, as I said, it is a competitive advantage that your employees own the company. They are engaged at a level. And they are, they are benefiting from the fruits not only of their labor, but the capital as well. And it just brings an attitude that therefore, when we're dealing with customers, they sense it. They understand that they're dealing with an owner. They're not dealing with just someone doing a job. And so it propels the company and it, uh, the attitude of your worker and the satisfaction level of your workers makes you a better company. And then being a better company, 
is a very productive loop there. It makes the workers happier too as well. So the two come together very naturally for us actually. And you touched on this a little bit earlier, but can you talk a bit more about how this played out during the pandemic and the period that we now know as the Great Resignation? What did things look like internally for your company then? You know, there, I have to say, they, it really proved itself during the pandemic. We're in critical industries. We didn't get to sit at home. We had people having to work from day one on the line, and we had to do it in very different ways. We had to really alter the layout of our factories and do a lot of things to keep people safe, but there would not have been trains running in the United States or trucks running or cars being built or buildings being cooled uh, were we still not working. And our people stepped up without fear, with courage, and, um, and I always felt that we couldn't have a two-class system either. We talk about divides in our society right now. We weren't going to have a world where the office workers were hiding at home and everyone else was laying it out on the line all the time. And the attitude throughout the company of, of stepping up and staying engaged, doing so in a safe manner, but staying engaged, it really played out during the pandemic. And frankly, we're a better company for it. Our people learned that they can adapt to any set of circumstances. And as an owner, that's what you do. And it was just reflected throughout the company. So it was a powerful test of our structure. I'm, I'm glad to say we were highly successful and, and, and we're a better company for it now. Fantastic. Tomas, I'd like to dive in a little bit more into Concerned Capital's approach. And tell us about what stage you start working with businesses. Um, how does this all work in practice? And can you give us some examples of what this transition to employee ownership looks like on the ground? Sure. I love talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> so I mentioned earlier, we, we kind of come in at that grassroots. It's when these little job shops, they're at 49 because Obamacare kicks them, at 50, kicks them into Obamacare, gets more expensive to operate. Operate, but at 49, mm. they can grow and operate and have a nice um, um, operation level of operation. But at some point, there's a there's a life event. That's when we usually get called. Uh, my uh, business partner Bruce Dobb and I have been working with manufacturers in this space in Southern California for 30 some odd years. And usually we get called by a banker or an accountant or uh, one of the local economic development groups saying, hey, this person had a life event. This place is in danger of closing. So it's a sudden and severe event that triggers us coming in and going, okay, let's figure out how to keep this ongoing concern still moving forward, capture that goodwill and those jobs and maintain that ability or maintain that capacity for the local supply chain. So we'll come in early um, and figure out what that path forward is. The goal is always 100% ownership of these businesses. Mm -hmm. But if we need to save the job by doing a transition that, that or creating a ownership model that creates a path to ownership for everybody, but maybe concentrated in a few people at first, or creates a profit share, or creates a, um, a shared governance model so that the employees feel, feel that they own it and want to stick around, that's how it always starts. And then we create the space to develop that culture of ownership that allows for co-ops or ESOPs to come in, but with the time that they need to be implemented well. Um, and, and I think that that's the, the key part of it. It's, it's being ready and being able to access tools like Layoff Aversion, be able to access different programs that are out there to support these businesses to get them past that rough time because that life event has triggered a crisis in that business. And so when you are coming in during a crisis, what are some of the biggest obstacles and challenges that you guys face? And where are the opportunities? How can you sort of transition from one to the next? Uh, lawyers. <laughs> you know, a lot of times what happens if the owner doesn't have a succession plan, it, it, it triggers to a trust. Mm -hmm. And then you have a lawyer who's managing the trust making decisions about the business. And oftentimes, because they're risk averse, the easiest thing for them to do is shut, shut the business down. And so you have a very small window of time to demonstrate to the family and to the, to the owner and to in that space, hey, there's another option here. And realistically, when you have someone who's near retirement age, they're kind of absentee owners already anyway. And so the, 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 com the company can run, run itself. So we come in and just kind of help package that idea in a different way. Because most of the time when you're telling an owner that you want to sell the business to their employees, the first th thought is, there's no way. Those are workers. Mm -hmm. They can't do what I do. They're, they're, they, they don't understand payroll. They don't understand you know, what it's like to have to carry insurance. They don't understand time, uh, <laughs> wage and hour lawsuits. They, and so, but it, it's getting past those initial things that kind of create the, the space for something like this to work. Perfect. 
Steve Storkin, uh, talk to us a bit more about these state centers and why that local approach is important here. Um, is this a model that works for everybody? You know, how do you how do you fit this to the companies that you're working with? Yeah, so I think you know, picking back in, picking back off what you said, employee ownership has been around since well, ESOPs have been around since 1974, and we heard from uh, Joseph yesterday that employee ownership has been around since you know Washington, George Washington's days. But um, with ESOPs and employee ownership, and specifically ESOPs, ESOPs have been sold, and I'll use the word sold because I used to be a practitioner. I never thought I was selling a product. And I know you don't feel like you're selling a product. But what I've learned as I've switched over to this nonprofit side, the business owners look at us as selling a product. And so the state center's role is to be a safe place for a business owner, a community leader, um, an advisor that doesn't want to look dumb because they don't know what you're talking about. It's a safe place to learn about employee ownership. And we're agnostic on, on what types of employee ownership, worker co-ops, employee ownership trusts, ESOPs. But it's a place for them to come with unbiased advice and to learn and to not feel like they're being sold the product. And we've seen that work. The more we create these centers, the more we do the storytelling, um, the less they feel that they're being sold the product because it is too good to be true. I'm a business owner. I've never heard about this. How could I never hear about this? Of course, this isn't true. And so that's the main purpose of a state center is to be that safe place um, to share that information. Um, we do that through storytelling. The number one way that we can do that is to not bring someone like me who has all of this knowledge about ESOPs and pretend like I'm speaking at their level or making it as easy to hear as possible. What I need to do is I need to bring Steve. I need to bring Veronica to the role, to the room and tell their story. And when I have a business owner in front of a group or one-on-one -on -one and tell their story, they now listen. And we are now in the room where it ha is going to happen according to the Hamilton uh, song. We just want to be in the room where it happened. We know it's not best for everybody, but right now we're not even outside of the building. We might not even be within three blocks. Mm -hmm. We just want to be in the room that it happens. And so that's what the state centers are doing uh, with a very limited staff right now, very limited capacity, but they're trying uh, across the country to tell that story. Perfect. Um, and that's a great transition to Veronica. Uh, Veronica, can you tell us in terms of culture and just being involved in day-to-day -day decision making, what does that look like for you? And I'm also interested in what working for an employee-owned company means for you and your co-workers, uh, co-owners, in terms of both your work life and your personal life. Thank you. Uh, well, at Webb, really the leadership insists, requires engagement from all employees, and we're actually all employee owners, and we're happy to do so. So, uh, and we do so in practical ways, right? We do things like book clubs, where we learn together and share ideas together and collaborate. Uh, and then we actually had one particular book club that turned into an implemented program. Uh, that book was um, Ideas Are Free. We read it as an organization. It's by, I'm going to remember, Alan Robinson and Dean Schroeder. Um, and this is, was actually an amazing uh, catalyst to, to really uh, promoting continuous improvement throughout web industries. It engages everyone at all levels in small teams. Um, the investment in time is very small. The teams are actually given the gift of being empowered to make the change if the team agrees on it and a budget to do so as well. So that's something that really has uh, facilitated a lot of positive change at Web and certainly a lot of buy-in from all our employee owners overall. Uh, throughout the years, we've also done a lot of um, brainstorming, again, involving everyone at every level at the company on how to achieve the company's objectives for the year. It's a really powerful tool when you gather someone, everyone, from the operator on the floor to your plant manager, and sometimes also the C-suite participates in, in this as well, where you're really together figuring out how you're going to be involved in increasing 50 percent uh, profits by 50 percent. You know, it's really something that um, I don't think your regular company would do. And something our employee owners truly appreciate. 
So working at Web, that definitely impacts the kind of culture we have. It's very much a family. I know you hear that over and over again from a lot of employee-owned companies. Um, most of us are just happy to go to work, happy to work together, and happy to grow the company. And it really has a monetary impact as well. So we've seen over the last 12 years a steady increase in, uh, in stock value of about 14 to 15%. And that includes a, a, a significant dip that occurred back in 2020, as you can imagine, when, when COVID hit us. And um, we serve, one of the industries we serve is the aerospace industry. So you can imagine that the aircraft uh, companies were not purchasing parts for, uh, to make new airplanes. Uh, our employee owners actually uh, really, really came uh, to task, and we had people uh, come from all of our sites, including our European sites, to assist in what was a pivot in business. So instead of serving the aerospace business, we concentrated on the medical market. We uh, expanded the um, one of our sites in, in Massachusetts, actually, to make uh, lateral fluidic immunoassay devices, or strip tests, in other words, like you would use for diabetes, but now we're making COVID tests, right? And this effort, this all hands on deck effort, we had the CEO, the CFO, an operator, customer service, all in one line packing COVID tests to be shipped out. And it's, it's one of those milestones within the company, and we knew that we were helping the company survive, our company survive and really uh, the plans for our wealth in retirement. So. Fabulous. Steve Storkin, uh, state centers are poised to grow, especially with the recently passed Work Act. I was wondering if you could offer your final reflections on where that work is headed and sort of what the future looks like. Looking for me? Yes. Or, uh, which Steve? We got Steve S. Right. All right. Well, before I get there, I do want to say I had the pleasure of visiting uh, Web Industries with Cor Congressman Courtney. Um, and one thing I never thought of is as we all open those COVID tests over and over and over again every single time <laughs> we had a sniffle, um, every single piece that was in that COVID test came from a different manufacturer. And here at Web Industries. There were six lines in a clean room, and each one of those pieces was put into that box by an employee owner. That blew my mind that we're opening these things thinking, <clears throat> you know, it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, that it, I don't know, I didn't know what I thought, but I had no idea. So every time I opened it, I thought of Web Industries. But as far as, uh, and so it was, it was just great to see that an aerospace company is now, I mean, the pivot, that doesn't happen. Uh, and that's employee ownership at work. As far as the Work Act goes, for those of you that don't know, the Work Act uh, was passed in December of 2022 as part of the Omnibus Spending Bill. And it authorized $50 million for the spending on education and outreach at the state level, specifically on employee ownership. Offers technical assistance, grants, other things that will be housed in the Department of Labor. And so starting in 2025, uh, that $50 million will be passed on to the states through a grant making process. Now, $50 million, when I first started to hear that and I heard that it got passed, uh, we definitely celebrated because what else could help a state center? What else could help many of our partners in this room who do outreach and education with us? And then I started to look at the numbers. And the numbers show that if every state were to try to access the maximum grant on year number one of 300,000, that gives us 13 states that have the ability to receive federal dollars to do this outreach and education. And if we all try to play nice and share, you know, the 21 state centers so far and the other partners across the country, we will be able to do a little bit. So we are part of a movement. We are part of a movement that's going to change the way business is done. I sometimes wonder whether or not the movement is here only and the people are not hearing us, but we're gonna take those dollars and try to increase that movement. But what we really need help with is increased capacity at all levels. We hope that these conversations that we're having with the state governments about housing state centers, getting some state uh, buy-in, maybe a state center uh, or office for employee ownership inside a state, that that will help create these conversations to say, 
there is more funding that needs to be needed, needs, need, is needed. We're seeing a lot of impact investing. We heard a lot about impact investing yesterday. I'm so excited about the EIA uh, bill, all the things that Jack and the ESUP Association and others are doing to bring capital to the table. And we're seeing a lot of capital come. But are we going to be able to fund the pipeline and the activity that's needed for people to invest in these job, into these companies? Because of COVID, we're seeing business owners coming out of the woodwork, woodwork saying, I don't ever want to go through that again. My wife said to me, you know, I saw a business owner who said, my wife said to me, you're an absentee owner, but you're really not an absentee owner, and you will sell the business. We need to retire. And he was happy that he found employee ownership. And so all of that being said, we're trying to come together to get that capacity so that we can have the outreach and education. And I'm super excited at where it's going, um, but I'm just a, a little bit hopeful also that we can bring more people to the table because right now I think it's the table is too small. Perfect. Uh, Veronica, we were talking before the panel about how you've been at Web Industries for 19 years and how that's a rarity these days. Um, a lot of younger workers move around a lot more often than that. And I'm wondering if you could talk to us about, you know, as we look to younger workers as the next generation of employee owners, what are some of the things we need to be considering and need to, need to be talking about? Thanks, Saba. Uh, we definitely have um, a workforce at, at Web where we have many people with longevity, right? We tend not to want to leave. Uh, but the newer generation coming in may not see it the, the same way. And so we've definitely had to think of ways to, to make web a compelling place to be. Certainly, uh, culture is one of those through doing things like engaging them in day-to-day -day decisions and empowering them to make changes to make their work life better. But also, there's more tangible things that are needed, right? And an ESOP certificate that isn't, uh, although it's awesome to look at, I appreciate mine every year, <laughs> um, it's, it's not something they can always relate to when it's 40 years out, right? So what's, what can I get sooner? So certainly, we heard some uh, talk about profit sharing. Web does that as well. And uh, that's definitely a helpful tool, I think, for that creating that compelling um, environment to retain you younger uh, employee owners. Uh, but we had to also turn to education. And uh, not just educating about ESOP and, hey, here's an employee who's been here 10 years. Look at what their certificate, of course, without names and, and such, what their certificate looks like and how much you could be earning if you were to stay here for this amount of time. But also incentivize with education. We have some people entering that maybe have some college or maybe uh, couldn't afford to pursue a master's and always wanted to. And so, yes, a lot of companies offer tuition reimbursement, but can we do it a little bit better than most companies do? So Webb's uh, education assistance program actually prepays tuition, fees, and books 100% for every employee who has an approved you know, curriculum at a college. Of course, there are some limitations, like uh, we, we won't pay for, for Yale or Harvard, <laughs> you know. Um, the, the, mon the monetary um, assistance is, is basically limited to an in-state state university tuition, which is great. You know, we have UMass in our backyard if we're in Massachusetts, which is an, an awesome institution, and there are many great state institutions. So that's definitely, uh, those are definitely some of the ways that we're working on holding on to our, to our younger work Force, and so far, we're having a pretty good track record. Tomas, <clears throat> excuse me. There's been an increase in community development financial institutions um, that are working with employee-owned companies. How important are these partnerships, and how do you, at Concerned Capital, help forge these connections? Oh, they're super duper important. To use a technical term. Um, <laughs> Concerned Capital is small. It's small and scrappy. Uh, in order to have impact, we need to have mission-aligned partners that can help us amplify what we're doing. And so we look around and find people who are going in the same direction but may not have the desired outcome that we have, and we kind of ride with them along as, as long as we can to get that desired outcome. One of those was actually the Aspen Foundation, and the Aspen Institute, and then, um, that's why I became a job quality fellow. So doing those things and, and, and connecting um, allows us to amplify that impact. We're actually doing a program right now that's funded by JP Morgan in conjunction with Common Future and the Urban, Man Urban Manufacturing Alliance called Tools for Equitable Acquisition and Manufacturing Team. <laughs> and what it does is train CDFIs 
and how to identify potential businesses that there are there that are already the borrowers that are ready for a transition in ownership, how to use the technical assistance funding that they have from the federal government to provide the the programming for the employees that want to buy the business, but also to connect to exit planners to help that owner really make that decision to leave the business. Right? And so by working with those CDFIs who are already positioned in local economies, who care about the local living economy and wanting to recirculate those dollars there, it's, it's a perfect match for that. And before I let, let, let go of the floor, I want to mention one thing. Cybersecurity. Um, a few years ago, I worked at the University of Southern California in their Center for Economic Development on a DOD-funded program to strengthen the competitiveness of the defense supply chain in Southern California. Cybersecurity is the biggest issue. It's one of the reasons why people are selling their businesses. Mm -hmm. They don't want to invest, they, or they don't have the money to invest to create new processes, to create new policies, to buy new servers, right? So it creates a real, it's a real threat. CDFIs are there to help bridge that and, and, in terms of the monetary, but there, there needs to be someone who can help them understand or has a desire to learn that new trick which is oftentimes the employees. Now, this is, I'm bringing this up here because it's not too far off, not too far in the future that insurance, business insurance premiums are gonna be based on how cyber secure you are. The ability to get federal contracts or be in the defense supply chain will depend on whether or not you're compliant with the federal government cybersecurity. Now, it's going to hit defense first, but it's going to go to the hospitals and everybody else later. I'm bringing this up again because happy employees are more careful about how they do things. And the number one breach in cybersecurity, the number one problem, is employee error. It's someone picking something up, someone leaving something open. It's, it's doing things that can be totally avoided, but that happy employees or more content or more involved employees, owners, would be a little more careful about because they don't want that, their own company to be open to that risk. So as we start talking about public policy, we start talking about how different ways to encourage this. Understand that uh, cybersecurity is going to be huge. Employee ownership can be the thing that gives that company a, a competitive advantage, but also, um, and not only in federal contracts, but in, in the defense supply chain and other supply chains. Perfect. Um, and one final question before we open this up to the audience. Uh, but Steve Smith, I'm wondering, you know, we've discussed already employee ownership has a lot of bipartisan support, which can be very rare these days. I'm wondering if you can walk us through that. Why does it have this bipartisan support and where should the conversation go from here? It does have great bipartisan bipartisan support. I'm always pleased that I see that on both sides of the aisle. Chuck Schumer has always said, how come there's not more of these, you know? Um, for, for the Republicans, it's the ownership society, and for the Democrats, it's almost socialism, right, uh, in a certain sense. So, um, it, And I always say to members of Congress, you don't get credit often, but this is something that you did quite a while back, and it's worked really well, and it's proven itself, and it needs to stay strong. I, I appreciate all the comments from my panelists, though. So people who are thinking about what to do in the transition of their business next often don't even think about this structure. And so what you're doing, Steve, I think is so crucial to make sure that there's broader awareness out there. And there also are impediments. The lawyers Tomas mentioned, and I'm a lawyer by training, I have to admit. <laughs> um, but uh, it's complicated sometimes. And people can come and say, ah, I can get you a sale right now, it's easy, you'll get your cash right away. It's a little more complicated. And and the Department of Labor, you know, their job under ERISA is to protect retirement plans and ESOPs are a retirement plan. Um, and But that's another layer of complication people have to complicate. There were deals done right before the 2008 crash, which were then reviewed after that crash. And under that prism, sometimes those could be challenged. And so someone considering whether or not to do an ESOP, uh, that's something they had to consider, that there were those kinds of complications. And finally, right now, maybe something that hasn't been talked about at this conference is the OECD. Some of you are aware of Pillar 1 and Pillar 2, and Pillar 2 would impose a 15% minimum tax on companies worldwide at the entity level. Well, the, the one thing that Congress did so well was provide a very beneficial uh, tax structure that helps these ESOP survive in the United States. And if that, under OECD, if those companies then became subject to that 15% tax, 
um, that would be very bad for ESOPs going forward. I think Department of Treasury is aware of this. Um, I know uh, ESCA is working with them uh, on that issue, and that's an issue that over time we want to make sure gets resolved appropriately with the OECD as well, too. So uh, all those things come together, but it's been an incredibly successful model, and um, I'll, I'll add on cybersecurity, too. Uh, you're exactly right, Tomas. Uh, we have 20 people who full-time just uh, spend 24-7 doing nothing more than monitoring our company. There are state actors out there right now. We were in Russia before the war began. We do a lot in China, and there are state actors out there right now who are often attacking, and you need to have robust, and we spend millions of dollars on that, just having robust defense. It's a crucial competitive uh, consideration. So thank you. Thank you. And if you have a question in the audience, please raise your hand and we'll get a microphone to you. I see some over here. Don't need a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, this one here. Okay. I visited 592 companies in my career in the ESOP world. I will tell you, I send tribute to the Aspen people and to the Rutgers people for having Amstead and Web Industries. You can imagine, 592 companies, some were wonderful, some were average, some were great disappointments. I also understand why so many members of Congress, no matter what their politics are on the big picture, are impressed when they're around ESOP employees. I thank Aspen. I thank Rutgers for having Amstead and Webb speaking to this group today. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> Thing that uh, I think comes up a lot that we don't know the answer to when we try and figure out why there's not more employee ownership and what the barriers are or whether we have a challenge with our product, you know, complexity, cost, lawyers, regulation, litigation, Department of Labor, all of the, you know, lack of, lack of capital uh, to make substantially all cash transactions, or whether our problem is a marketing problem, awareness, knowledge of the idea of an ESOP and what and how to uh, accomplish it. And thirdly, of course, misinformation, which is incorrect knowledge about what ESOPs do and don't do. I'm wondering whether there is and where, how can we have some research into the marketplace to figure out whether our core issues are, quote unquote, product issues or marketing issues. I've tended to believe, with my own experience, that it is much more of a marketing problem. It's much more of an awareness issue because I have not had, in my experience, of going out and talking to the world about ESOPs and trying to accomplish them. I haven't found that things don't happen because people say, well, there's too much litigation or it's uh, too complicated. Now, I talk to the selected group of people who are aware and have become interested, but I'd love to hear both hear comments and ultimately to see some real research about how business owners make decisions and whether ESOPs are part of the considered set and why they don't choose an ESOP if it is part of the considered set. I can, I can address what we're seeing uh, just in the four and a half years that we've been uh, out there doing this, uh, and there are other state centers that have been around for a really long time uh, that say kind of the same thing. Uh, we would agree that it's aware, <clears throat> awareness and knowledge, and that if someone comes to us and they are ready to exit their company or change the ownership, that they're not coming and saying, and then leaving and saying, well, that was just too much. That was just too complex. If they come in the door, unfortunately right now, most of them that are coming in the door are not ready to exit. They're simply saying, I now have to exit. I got to start thinking about this. I should have done this a long time ago. But if they come in the door and they're starting to get the information, they may not take the employee ownership route because there are other things that you know, happen, but it's not because of the complexity or the misinformation. I would love to see whether or not, from a study standpoint, that proves that, but there are no statistics. We want to make sure, and we're starting to get baseline data with the people that come through the doors, 
if they don't go employee ownership, why? And so we're starting that. I'd love to have some help on the research side. We're doing it anecdotally, but uh, I think that's a key, a key stat that we have to find out. Hello, um, I'm Mary Ann Beister. Thank you all for being here. Um, Tomas, I'm, I'm very excited about hearing your efforts with CDFIs. If I understand correctly, we have about 1,000 CDFIs serving rural and urban communities across the United States. Um, I've had the honor of supporting several of them that have recognized employee ownership and cooperatives as part of their mission. I'd like you to comment on um, how many CDFIs understand and offer support to employee owned and, and cooperatives. Um, and through your training, how many are you trying to reach? Um, two other questions is how can we help spread the word? And what research opportunities do you think there might be? Well, thank you for, for asking the questions. I mean, I'm a big fan of my own voice, so anytime I get to talk a little <laughs> bit more about it. Um, look, I think we have a challenge in the CDFI space right now because there are some that are very oriented towards profit and, towards, and, and growing and growth. And they're directing or or directing their efforts towards partnering with private equity and, and venture capital to, to move things forward. And employee ownership doesn't fit in those spaces. When you have the, the, the core of the CDFIs, which I want to believe is more of them, but I, it's becoming farther and fewer in between and more competitive to, to raise money, so it's a challenge. But there are some really core CDFIs that are good and who are f focused on doing that type of work. I think the opportunity for us is to tell this story in a way that makes it compelling to all the CDFIs, that this is a way to not only increase the number of borrowers that they have available to them, but also can help them raise capital that's concerned about this kind of issue from um, mission-aligned uh, capital sources, as well as how they can make an impact that, that's part of their charter, right? Um, I think the increased attention on it at the federal level, especially from um, the Department of Treasury and from the different um, the parts of the government, are also influencing those kinds, kinds of things. But it, it's, it's messaging, and we just got to keep at it. Because again, CDFIs, I think, I think a lot of times in terms of time, right? When I'm trying to make that case to somebody, it's like, what time frame are you thinking? Right? A CDFI might be thinking quarterly in terms of what are my numbers, what, are, what bonus am I getting, or what, are, what do I have to do in this quarter to figure this out? So how do I make that easier for them to hit those quarterly numbers? How do we package this in a way that makes it more compelling to them? Whereas the, the, employee, the, the owners that I'm talking to are usually thinking about the next payroll cycle. They're thinking about the next, you know, if, if they're in the strategic planning of you know, longer, it might be the next quarter. But understanding what the different audiences' timeframes are has been the most helpful thing for us to, to, to get the CDFIs. We've trained four right now. That's part of the first cohort. Um, we'd love to open it up and do additional training for it now that we've developed the curriculum and the programming. We're working with, like I said, Common Future and UMA on um, spreading that out across the country. The initial four are CDC Small Business Finance, um, CRF USA up in Minneapolis, PCR in Los Angeles and Mountain BizWorks in Asheville, uh, North Carolina. So we're trying to hit all over, um, and you know, and and move it forward. And I, I just real quick, I think the State Small Business Credit Initiative, which the funding for State Small Business Credit Initiative, SSBCI 2.0, is a huge opportunity. Uh, the state centers are working. I can't wait to talk to you more about your program. We're, we're trying to do the same thing. But the dollars that have come into CDFIs from all the different programs, but specifically SSBCI that says employee ownership is an authorized use, uh, we have a huge opportunity. So far, no one's taken up taken us up on it. They, it's, they're, like you said, they're too busy. It's, it's just not in their wheelhouse right now, and we got to change that. So. Great. We have time for one last question in the back. Uh, my question is for Veronica. Uh, successful employee-owned companies that last any amount of time, create their ownership culture, ultimately face a key challenge of leadership transition. Whether it's the founder leaves or a longtime CEO leaves, Web Industries recently went through that process. Can you speak to that, how you dealt with it from an internal employee perspective and a general sense of how it went? Thank you for that question. That is definitely a challenging time. You are, you are not mistaken there. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's difficult for those of us who aren't necessarily on a C-level role to affect 
that change, um, to indoctrinate, if you will, the new sea level folks into the culture of web. But thankfully, because we have those, those relationships, and I think Jen Briggs mentioned yesterday that the culture happens when you have, and I'm paraphrasing, but this connection, right, the, the connection of people, that uh, we are very comfortable with the sea level suite, right? We can have challenging conversations and have. And, you know, they may not be able to give us a response right away. They're not going to go, you know, reprimand someone for not fitting into the web culture right away. But they will work through, um, through sort of training them and, and indoctrinating them into that culture. So I talked a little bit before about book clubs, right, and, and just implementing systems to, uh, to aid in growing that culture. That happens on a leadership level as well. There's a lot of training. Uh, there is recognition that we, we had some gaps. In, uh, in really living that culture on a leadership level. And so our team is actually, our leadership team is working with the Brown Center and going through the advantage. And really in an effort to remove politics out of, out of their management style and really, again, embrace the culture that Webb has had for, for many years now. And, um, and so far, and, and also I should say, there is a, um, a along with that training, that happens on leadership level and on all levels, there is like a heightened uh, social sensitivity training, if you will, so that we learn to work well with one another, regardless of, of roles and titles. Thank you. I'll just add, you know, CEO succession is something that's near and dear to my heart, too. And there's a strong bias towards an internal success, or if at all possible. And I have an entirely independent board, uh, which not all ESOP companies do. And But, you know, I work with them assiduously to make sure they understand how important the culture is to our success. And so they will understand when dealing with the successorship issue that that has to be a paramount consideration as well. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for a fascinating conversation and for joining us this morning.